What's up y'all, Shuffle back again with another guide slash discussion type video and today we are going to be talking about the concept of action economy. This is something I bring up pretty consistently on stream and in my videos so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what strategies look like when they are proactive and reactive because those are two classes or specific ways to play Darkest Dungeon and once I explain it it'll probably make a lot more sense and then we'll explain how this all translates into battles and how you can use this to your advantage and hopefully get more out of your game, maybe play better, have better teams, better outcomes, stuff like that. So I hope you enjoy it. And I can't stop thinking about something that Thick said when I mentioned I was going to be doing this video. He said it's quantum theory on DD combat and I think that's pretty fitting. So before we get started, obviously if you have not already, check out all the social media stuff down below like Patreon. I stream on Twitch four days a week and join Discord if you have not already because there are a lot of cool, awesome people there. We have over 500 people. That's a lot of people. Now that that's out of the way, let's start with Action Economy. So Action Economy is a concept that if you've played tabletop games before like Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons or Call of Cthulhu or all the other awesome systems out there, you've probably heard this term before. So Action Economy is talking about how many actions you get per round of combat or whatever the encounter is and how impactful each of those actions are. In terms of Darkest Dungeon, the player characters have up to five things they can do per turn of combat. They have four skills, unless you're Abomination who has all seven of his skills, and then they have the ability to move, which is your fifth thing. I guess you could also consider pass as well, that's something we just normally don't do. In fact, the button for it is much smaller than the other buttons, so you don't accidentally press it, and I forgot it existed until right now. Likewise, the enemy only gets to do one thing per turn, the difference for action economy shows up for bosses. I'm not going to spoil which bosses have multiple actions if you have not seen them, but I have alluded to them several times. Those are where action economy gets a little more interesting because if you've ever played an RPG or a tabletop game, for instance, and you got or you say to yourself, "Okay, we're we have our four people, like our group of player characters, PCs. There's four of us." and we go into a battle and there's seven enemies. You say to yourself, wow, this is a little intimidating, or maybe this fight's kind of hard, and you think, oh, it's because we're outnumbered. And that is the right way to think about it, but what I'm getting at with action economy is if you're outnumbered in that situation, so like seven to four, the enemy is getting three more actions each turn compared to you. So that's more dice rolls, that's more chances to cast spells or heal and stuff like that. So that's where the idea of action economy comes in. Likewise, in those same scenarios, if you have your four player characters against one you know, spellcaster and they're casting one spell a turn, even if the spells are pretty dangerous and high level, as long as they're not just killing people outright in your team, you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, this is a bit easier. The spells are dangerous, but there's only one a turn that we have to watch out for. And that's the same idea of action economy. So oftentimes in tactical games and RPGs, the idea of action economy is what wins out. Usually in these types of games, the way you can generate advantage, or in this case tempo, which is a card game term I use quite frequently, which refers to momentum, that's what tempo translates to. So in these situations, being able to generate more actions or get higher value from your actions are how you win games and leverage your advantage. Here are some examples in Darkest Dungeon of action economy and like positive action economy. So one thing I hear constantly is when you use stuns, especially from newer players, is they say, why do I want to stun enemies? I'm just trading my turn for theirs. And that's not entirely true. There are instances like Plague Doctor who has blinding gas that stuns two enemies. You're trading one turn for two. That is generating huge advantage every time you do it and then every other stun in the game does something proactive with it. You never, like there's no move in the game that stuns and does nothing else. It always does something else that can generate advantage. Even Disorienting Blast from Plague Doctor and Flashbang from Bounty Hunter, those stun one enemy, they do no damage, but they can move enemies and sometimes you can move enemies into really bad positions or Disorienting Blast destroys corpses when you use it. 
So those are examples that even if they don't do damage, they're still doing other things. And that's ignoring the fact that we have Blinding Gas for double stun, Yop for double stun, Uppercut does damage, Hands from the Abyss crits all the time so it stress heals and does damage. There are a lot of examples of stuns that just do extra stuff. So even if you're trading your turn for the enemy's turn, you're still doing something else on top of it, which again is compounding this idea of generating tempo and advantage. It doesn't just stop at stuns though. There are quite a few other examples in the game. As I've been talking about, some turns are more important than others. Anna Aquarian, for instance, her turns, or I should say her buttons are okay. You know, they're not hands from the abyss. They're not blinding gas. They're not iron swan. Those are all just incredible moves in their own right. When you play someone like Anna Aquarian, her buttons aren't that strong. So her action economy, her turns, are worth a bit less than other characters. For instance, Man at Arms can guard allies, but Man at Arms also has this thing where he wants to be doing a bunch of stuff every turn. He's pretty starved on action economy, that's the hardest thing about playing him, is he has buffs he wants to put down, he has a good stun he wants to use, he has a solid moving crush he wants to use, he has retribution, he has guard, he has bellow, he has all these things he wants to be doing, and spending one turn guarding someone is nice, but it's not as effective as, for instance, an Aquarian pressing Protect Me to spend that turn guarding four Man at Arms. An Aquarian can even guard four Man at Arms. She can use Protect Me on him, and then he just gets to use Retribution, which means he's doing other stuff and freeing up his own turns, which are worth more than an Aquarian's. I'm hoping that's not too confusing, but I think that gets the point across, where not all turns are equal in this game. So if you can spend one turn doing something that's worth more than someone else's turn, that's again generating small advantage, but it's still worth it because being able to generate those advantages in Darkest Dungeon is key to winning, and it helps you get through even the toughest fights. Another example is pretty simple, it's the speed stat. Having higher speed stat or lowering the enemy's speed stat means you get more turns than they do. Perfect, that generates advantage. When you use something like Point Blank Shot and you have Shield Breaker, that's a pretty popular combo, is having Shield Breaker, who can use very strong rank 1 moves, push herself back, and then Highwayman has Point Blank Shot, which Highwayman has other things he could be doing, but if you really want those Shield Breaker moves like Adder's Kiss and Impale, for instance, you can circumvent Shieldbreaker's major weakness of having to spend an extra turn getting yourself back up to the front and just have someone else do it for her and you're still making this huge tempo gain by doing so. On the same idea of speed, Marching Plan, the Arbalist Camp skill, massive tempo, gives your entire team two extra speed. That's more turns. Battle Ballad, that is probably the highest tempo generating move in the entire game. It gives you crit, which kills enemies faster, which takes their turns away, gives you accuracy, which helps you take enemy turns away by killing them, and it gives you speed, which we've been talking about gets you more turns. Outside of Battle Ballad, the other action economy monarch is Repost. Only two characters have this in the base game, so that's Man at Arms and Highwayman. And being able to get extra attacks every single turn is just straight up cheating the action economy system. If you think about it like that, instead of just getting to attack once in a turn, like Highwayman and Man at Arms normally get to do, you set up Repost, and if you get hit, you know, two more times in that turn, especially Man at Arms who can guard people, you're attacking two or three times a turn. That is massive gain in terms of damage output. And these are all of the, I shouldn't say all, but these are just some of the examples of positive action economy in the game. And now we'll talk about proactive stuff. Proactive strategies are ones that help you dictate what's happening in the game, and in Darkest Dungeon, we'll go through some examples here, but you'll start to see that reactive plays are usually not as good in this game. So normally when you play RPGs, you think, okay, I take damage, I heal. But actually a huge thing in Darkest Dungeon for success is denying enemy turns, so you generate action economy. And this idea was the central idea of this video. It spawned into action economy at some point but on Wednesday or you know last week or whatever it is at this point whenever I release this video I was playing this weird team with an Aquarian I just had a bunch of leftovers that I was trying to level up to level three and I had an Aquarian 
I had Hellion, Abomination, and I think Plague Doctor. And I was like, this team doesn't have a dedicated healer. It has, you know, a self-heal, it has a couple self-heals, and then some off-healing, stuff like that. But I was thinking to myself, can this team beat a long Ruins mission? Granted, they were all level uh, 2 with level 3 items, so that did help quite a bit. But it was still Torchless, which is dangerous. And that team actually did pretty fine in that dungeon, even though it had no dedicated healer. It had very limited stress healing outside of camp skills. And the reason it was able to do so well is because I had a lot of speed on my units and I had stuns all over the place. So because I had this, I could leverage the opening round, denying a bunch of turns, and the goal was to get hit once on turn one and maybe once on turn two, and then the fight was over and I won at that point. Just because I was able to do enough damage, stall the enemy long enough by stunning the hell out of them, and then killing the big threats and then leaving the weak threats at the end. I tell you this story because this just goes to show how good denying actions is in this game and how strong being proactive is. And again, I still have math on my side to prove that reactive strategies aren't as good. So when we talk about proactive strategies, we have to consider tempo, which is what I said, or I defined as momentum. So anything that just gets you extra turns. And these are things like stuns, movement skills, preventing damage, speed. I wrote movement skills twice in my, my notes here. Then scouting. Scouting is actually a proactive thing, so knowing where battles are, not getting surprised is really nice. And then obviously preventing surprises themselves, preventing nighttime ambush. These are just examples of proactive plays. These are things that let you dictate how fights are going to go when you're on expeditions. Proactive plays can be set up for battles, but also things that you do in town, such as giving yourself speed, or picking scouting trinkets, or picking fast heroes, just fast heroes in general, so you're able to go first and get extra turns and deny enemy turns. These are all examples of proactive plays. The other side of this idea is reactive strategies. So no surprise, reactive stuff are things like heals. So HP heals, stress heals, town facilities are reactive. It seems kind of weird to think of reactive play outside of battles, but in town, healing stress is reactive. Moving your units without movement skills, so no holy lance, no lunge, no get down, none of that stuff. Just hitting the fifth button, the blue one with the arrows, and moving someone a couple spaces, that is a reactive play because it has very low tempo. You're not doing anything. You're just moving your unit. You're basically you're almost skipping your turn entirely. You're you're not quite doing that, but something like Holy Lance where you get to move and do damage, that's fantastic. Moving and doing nothing else is pretty weak by comparison. Even if you favor a reactive game style, you just want to bring Jester and Vestal to every dungeon and have all the super sustain. There are times for it. I'm not going to say that I haven't done it. I still do it for certain missions, and it's still very powerful. But even if you're playing reactive playstyles, having proactive elements still makes your reactive stuff even better. So there's this idea of stalling in Darkest Dungeon where you kill two or three enemies on the enemy team and then just bleed or blight the front one and stun it and just waste, or it seems like you waste time, but then you just spam your recovery moves because recovery as one-to-one -one against enemy skills is usually weaker than what the enemy can do. So the way to make recovery worth it is you have to slow the game down and grind out the last few turns to get more HP and stress heals out. Because otherwise, you can't just spend Jester's turn to counter Cultist Witch. It just, the numbers don't match up for that. This is probably the easiest mathematical example I can show to prove why being proactive is better than being reactive. So if we look at the Cultist Witch at Champion, and we look at Jester at level 5 or level 6 with level 5 skills, we have Stressful Incantation. On paper, at Champion, it causes 20 stress, and Jester can heal 12 stress with Inspiring Tune and give you a buff that prevents 20% of stress damage. So you can already see just by the raw numbers, you take 20 stress and heal 12. You're already 8 points behind, and if we say, okay, let's give Inspiring Tune all of its benefits. Let's say that Cultist Witch uses Incantation twice on the same person. So she deals 40 total stress, so you get hit for 20, you heal 12, she does it again, you block 20% of that. You took 36 stress across 2 turns. 
because you couldn't stun her and you did nothing else. You're just reacting to what Cultist Witch did to you. Now let's bring in someone like Plague Doctor. Plague Doctor, her best strength is being able to stun both enemies in the back of the party, or the enemy party. So if we stun Cultist Witch on turn one, maybe we get lucky and we go first. You stun her, you take zero stress from Cultist Witch. And hopefully you can kill her. Maybe you have units that are attacking her that same turn. So you stun her, you hit her once really hard. Plague Doctor goes again, like at the start of the round before Cultist Witch. Her stun wears off and then she hits her with like Plague Grenade. And then the Blight damage over time effect just kills her. You took zero stress in that scenario. Even if we use the Jester scenario, where we have someone attacking the Cultist Witch, maybe Cultist Witch, you know, she's pretty fast, so she goes first, you stress heal, so you took 20, you healed 12 of it, so you're back down to 8 in terms of stress net gain, and then you get a crit and you just kill Cultist Witch. You still took 8 stress, and you spent Jester's turn using Battle Ballad instead of stunning two people, whereas with Plague Doctor, even if Plague Doctor low rolls and goes second then you take the 20 and then you kill cultist switch by turn three because you know she hits you you stun her she's stunned on turn two she dies on turn three that's about as fast as she should go down so in that scenario you take 20 against eight but you still stun the back line so these preventative measures are still better and even in this case where plague doctor just gets unlucky and goes last you still have a very good chance of blocking 20 stress very consistently instead of having to heal 12 every time. Because if you're just using reactive plays over the entire dungeon, you are going to accumulate stress and damage. You just can't keep up with it without being able to disrupt the enemies with movement or stuns. We don't even have to keep considering stuns though for this example. Let's look at something like Pelagic Shaman, which I affectionately call the Pinkfish from the Cove. It's a stress caster, it sits in the back, it's pretty fast. And it does things like Stress Wave, which hits two people for, I don't know, what is like 14 stress at max level, something like that. And Cultist, not Cultist, Pelagic Shaman is a unit that if you pull it up to the front, so rank one, it's stuck with this really weak dagger attack. So you can get a lot of action economy advantage or tempo gain, however you want to describe it at this point, just by moving enemies where you can stun an enemy and leave them in place and you know that's good and it does amazing things movement is interesting because enemies that are vulnerable to movement you can just not only mess up one enemy you can actually mess up two enemies sometimes three and doing that is effectively stunning multiple enemies at the same time whereas instead of taking one of their really good attacks every other turn you can move them out of position and you take weak attacks every turn which means that the stress casters that start off as huge threats, like Bone Courtier or Pelagic Shaman or a Gunner Bandit that can hit you with, you know, the Cleave Gunshot, stuff like that, moving them around... Actually, let's think about that, too. The Stock Bandit fight, where you have Big Bandit, Sword Bandit in Rank 3, and then Gunner Bandit in uh, Rank 4, just using something like Damon's Pull or a good Flashbang or Come Hither, for instance, Pulling that Gunner Bandit out of the back up to the front of the enemy party means that not only does Gunner Bandit use Rush Shot, which is much weaker, the Sword Bandit in the back uses Harmless Poke. So you've already disrupted two enemies at the same time and forced them to use weak moves. I know that later versions of Gunner Bandit have stealth, but this is, you know, just the theoretical discussion that we're having right now. We can compound this idea of emphasizing our reactive play, so heals and stuff like that get much better not only on stalling targets that are stuck in front, like weak frontliners, but being able to pull a stress caster up to the front where they're just locked up there for the rest of the battle, that is like the ideal stunt or stall target because instead of getting hit for stress wave for, you know, 28 a turn across two targets, you just lock them up front and they just hit you with the dagger for five damage. And that's much better than getting hit by whatever else is in the cove. Which is interesting because it turns these super huge threats into like the most harmless enemies out there. And they're the best stall targets, which is pretty nice. Sadly, not enough enemies are vulnerable to this type of thing. So I hope that's something that changes in the sequel. I think the best way I can drive home the idea of something that's proactive versus something that's reactive is with the idea of something as simple as bleed resist. So in a dungeon, let's say the cove, because bleed is pretty common there, if I have Plague Doctor, 
I spend one of her turns, something like an Uka Crab hits me with Arterial Pinch, I'm bleeding, it hurts quite a lot, and I spend Plague Doctor's turn using Battlefield Medicine to cure it. I'm using Plague Doctor's turn against an enemy like Uka Crab, which really wants to be stunned or hit with Blight. If you don't have Armor Piercing or Mark, or some way to reduce armor, again Mark, then Plague Doctor matches up very well against this enemy. Even with Battlefield Medicine, she pretty much hard counters everything this thing can throw at you. But if you have Plague Doctor, would you rather be stunning or using Blights, or would you rather spend her very precious turn healing their bleed? It's kind of nice in the way that it does save money, because you don't have to use a bandage. But let's bring in the idea of Bleed Resist. Bleed Resist is proactive, it's not reactive. You're not taking the bleed when, or ideally you're not taking the bleed when you have Bleed Resist. And this frees up Plague Doctor's turn. So the same scenario, your person with Bleed Resist gets hit with Arterial Pinch, they resist. That means Plague Doctor can throw Noxious Blast to do 21 damage, or she can stun it to deny a turn. And those are much more valuable than using Battlefield Medicine. For as good as Battlefield Medicine is, it's a button that we don't want to have to press. We'd rather press all of Plague Doctor's really good buttons. And before we talk about how this can apply to your gameplay, even though we've sprinkled these tips in so far, the last thing I'll talk about here for this section is camp skills. So we have things like marching plan that I talked about before, tactics, those are proactive, you're preventing damage either through getting extra turns, preventing enemy turns, making the enemy lose turns by missing you, that's why dodge is so cool with tactics. Whereas if you use things like Zealous Speech, for as much as I love Zealous Speech, it is a very reactionary type of thing. It does have proactive elements with the stress resist, but anything that reduces stress in camp or gives you healing, for instance, those are all reactive things. And if we can, we like to hit the proactive ones more just because they feel like they have more value. It's not bad to hit the reactive ones, but honestly, do you feel do you feel good hitting Encourage or one of Jester's three-point camp skills to reduce stress or would you rather hit sharp and spear and get 10 crit with hellion i would rather hit sharp and spear honestly although that is not to knock the idea of recovery strats they are nice to have and they are very necessary unless of course your name is candle and you make a video on beating darkest dungeon without getting hit a couple tips to wrap up this video how does that apply to you as a player to start there is this common wisdom in the community of killing backliners first if you play the game for i don't know even an hour You'll probably understand that the backline enemies are usually squishier so they go down easier but they also have the nastier moves like stress or they buff their teammates or they can hit your squishy backliners like with crossbows and stuff like that you understand that the backline enemies are generally more threatening not every time but they're generally more threatening the reason they are more threatening it's not just because of their reach for instance it's because of their speed the backline enemies tend to have higher speed. They get more turns. So if you can get rid of them faster, they get less turns. Well, they get no turns because they're dead. But the frontline enemies, they're generally just a couple points slower. They're easier to corral. They're easier to stun. They do HP damage instead of stress damage in a lot of cases. And hit point damage is much easier to heal than stress damage. Stress damage is kind of a pain to get rid of. So this means that backline enemies are usually the bigger threats, which is why characters with reach like hellion or crusader or characters with massive speed like a bomb or i should say abomination and plague doctor are really good at handling backline enemies the goal in those cases is usually to stun them and let them get one turn maximum like i said since frontline enemies are slower they're easier to stun they're easier to stall against they're easier to recover against which is all fantastic since they're also slower than you this idea of action economy returns once again, and frontline enemies, on average, get one less turn than you do. This was something, I wish I remembered who said this, but someone in my tier list video, I believe, said that the reason they don't like Crusader is because of the bad speed that he has, and I was like, yeah, that's, you know, I hear, I hear that all the time, who cares? But then the person said that Crusader, on average, gets one less turn per fight than every character. And once they said it like that, I went, oh my goodness, that's right, that is so smart, that's exactly what happens. Even though Crusader has all these great recovery moves, he gets one less turn per battle than everyone, unless he's the one doing the killing, which is a waste of his recovery moves. So just hearing that alone is kind of a big knock against Crusader. 
The way a normal hallway or room battle plays out is there are two phases. This, like, you can kind of get this intuitively from playing, but if you want to hear it in an actual explanation, it comes down to two phases. There is the rush phase, or the burst phase, rushdown phase, or opening, whatever you want to call it. It has several names, but the first two, maybe three turns in a fight that isn't a boss are when you want to kill or stun as many enemies as possible, or move them. You just want to disrupt the enemy, take away as many of their turns as possible, because that way you're not taking the burst damage from the enemy team. If you were able to consistently disrupt the enemies so they get maybe two turns back to back instead of four, you're going to notice your characters live a lot longer. Which is actually why surprising the enemy is kind of dangerous sometimes, because if you surprise the enemy, they all go last guaranteed after all of your heroes, and if you're not stunning or killing any of the enemies at the start during your surprise round, they get four turns back to back, and if any of them outspeed you, they can get up to six turns back to back. That is terrifying. So this is why we again need to bring disruption, so movement, or big damage, or stuns, and take turns off the enemy side of the field as quickly as possible. Anyway, that was kind of tangential, so you start by spending the first two or three turns disrupting the enemy, taking out the big threats, and then you spend the next two or three turns recovering. A normal fight is decided around turn three or four. On average, I would say turn three, because on turn three, usually the two biggest threats on the enemy side should be down if your team is performing optimally, and then you're down to two enemies, sometimes one on the enemy side, which means at that point you can enter the stalling phase or recovery phase. I don't think I've heard it called anything else, just those two. So you spend first couple turns, neutralize threats, last couple turns, stalling a little bit, just to squeeze out a couple extra heals. I know it's not the most exciting gameplay to be a part of, but it is the most effective. And sadly, if there was anything that was close to a meta in this game, this is about as close to it as you're going to get, just because it is the most optimal way to do things. The too long didn't read of this video, action economy is fantastic, being proactive gets you more turns, more turns are how you win fights. There are certain bosses in the game that not only do they get multiple actions a turn, there are some bosses, the way that they work, like how they fight against the player, is they try to win through action economy. There are a couple bosses or enemies that like to move your entire party or move a couple people, and when they move your entire party, you have to spend extra turns suboptimally if you don't have dance moves, like lunge for instance, repositioning your party to get them back into their best spots to do what you want them to do, which means that while you're doing that, the enemy is winning through action economy, which is why we have to be on the lookout for it. The next point, if you're not seeing good results in your expeditions in Darkest Dungeon, try to bring faster characters that have stuns like Plague Doctor, Occultus in the front line with Hands of the Abyss is good, Abomination with Manacles is pretty solid, so try and start bringing those things to your party and see if just having a couple extra stuns to disrupt the enemy and prevent you from getting hit in the face every turn gives you better results. Again, the reason that we like speedy characters, especially ones that can stun like Plague Doctor, is the fact that they prevent so much damage from coming into you. So if you think about it like, yeah, Plague Doctor, you know, at worst 20 stress gets through from Cult of Switch. Sometimes there are two stress casters and you get hit twice. And that's just unfortunate. But if you think about it over a long period of time, over a lot of battles, and this is before we add in quirks and trinkets like Feather Crystal or On Guard, for instance, which gives Plague Doctor a huge speed advantage. If we have like six fights in a dungeon and we repeat this scenario six times, eight times, ten times, for instance, then you're denying a ton of stress. All you have to do is like deny this opening from Cult of Switch four times, you've denied 40 stress, or not 40, 80 stress. So it adds up very quickly in a game that is focused on incremental advantage and inches. All right, y'all, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. Obviously, go check out the social media stuff in the box below. Like, comment, subscribe, all that garbage if you enjoyed what you saw. Let me know what you're thinking down below. Let me know if there's something I missed because there's just a lot to this topic. It is a fun one to talk about. Let me know if you've had better experiences with recovery. You know, there are probably crazy stories out there that I obviously don't know. And yeah, that's it. So next time, I am trying to work on one of the guides. I'm a little bogged down with the Antiquarian Guide right now, but I'm trying. 
And as far as the Twitch stuff goes, like I said, four days a week. Wednesdays are variety days for Twitch and YouTube. Otherwise, I'm looking to do more discussion videos, a couple tier lists, got guides and stuff like that out there. So I'm going to shut up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.